Today's app we're going to be learning is Ketubo Daf Yutet. We're going to start with a review of what we finished yesterday and move on from there. So we saw a Brita that said, we were talking about a, a Mishnah that witnesses said, these are our signatures, and since we have no other proof of otherwise, we believe them when they say, yes, these are our signatures, but we were forced into this, we were not false witnesses, we were, um, we were, um, Ketanim, right, or we were disqualified witnesses. So now, the Brita says, They can't disqualify their own testimony. So the rabbis match what we saw in our Mishnah, they're believed. To which the Gemara said, we understand the rabbis' opinion because that's what we've been dealing with. Since they're the ones who said that they were witnesses, it's only because of them that we even think that the star is a valid star. It's a valid document, therefore we believe them to undo it. But, Rabbi Meir, we don't understand. So when it comes to Eidut, we said, well, if they say Psule Eidut, there's no way that the Malva would have accepted a disqualified witness. So for sure, it must be that they're valid witnesses, and that's why we don't believe them. If they were minors, also Rish Lakish says, no minors, we don't ever let minors sign on a document, so it can't be that. And now we're up to the the last part, starting in line two of Daf Yutet. Ela Anusi my time. Why aren't they believed to say we were forced into it? Um, Rav, Chista, Rav Chista says, Kasaval Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Meir holds, that they deem she'amru lahem chitmu sheker, ve'al targu, yargu ve'al yachtimu sheker. Fascinating line. In a minute, we're going to say this is totally not true. But Rabbi Meir said, we say, Rav Chista says, Rabbi Meir must hold that when witnesses are told, sign or we'll kill you, sign here, right? Lie for this testimony or we're going to kill you. You should get killed and you shouldn't sign. Basically, this is what we call him sor nefesh, okay? Just let yourself get killed. Don't ever do this, which means there's no way we believe these witnesses where they say, this is what Rabbi Meir is going to say. We don't believe these witnesses when they say we were forced into it, you know, someone put a gun to our heads, because they're basically, this is we go back to Anna Damasim Atzmo Rasha. People wouldn't incriminate themselves in court, and it's forbidden to do that. You can't sign because someone put a gun to your head. To which Rava says, what are you talking about? I'm really Rava. He says it in such an interesting way. If those people had come to us and asked us, or we, what, are, what should we do in this situation? Someone told me, if I don't sign by tomorrow morning, they're going to kill me. We say to them, go sign and don't get yourself killed. Because it was stated, nothing stands in the face of your life. Your life is more important than anything. The only time you're supposed to give your life for something is the famous three. Ela, avodat kochavim, v'giloi arayot, u'shvichut amin bilvat. Only if someone says, go worship idols, or go sleep with this person who you're forbidden to, right? Go marry your sister, or shvichut amin, or murder. That's it. Just those three. But anything else, okay, we'll get to this in Sanhedrin. Why specifically those three? Where is it derived from? But basically, in this case, if they signed, they didn't do anything wrong. What, we're going to say to them, why did you sign and you're a terrible person? Of course not. This is what we tell them to do. So that's not a good reason. So therefore, they explain, So Rav explains the reason for Rabbi Meir must be, like Rav Huna said in the name of Rav, Rav Huna said in the name of Rav, if the love, the person who borrows the money, admits that this is the star, then it doesn't anymore need kiyum star. It doesn't need the witnesses to prove. It doesn't need the witnesses to say these are our signatures, or we don't need someone to validate the witnesses' signatures. So what the connection of this is is not exactly clear. Some people say that's similar to this case, but we'll go with a different interpretation, which basically says that according to this, it's also not the most simple answer, but. When Rabbi Meir says they're not believed, it must be a case where the love admitted that it that it was his star. That he had signed this document, okay, or that he had had this written up for a loan. In which case, you don't need the signatures of the of the witnesses. In which case, you don't need the witnesses to tell you. In other words, there's no pesha sawa peshi itir here. Because... The witnesses aren't believed because you don't need them to verify their signatures. Their signatures are valid anyway. Now that they're trying to mess up the star, we don't believe them that they're messing up the star because we have a fully valid document. Okay? And then it's more like the case in our Mishnah of Im Yesh Edim, 
then we're not going to believe them, right? If there's witnesses to verify their signatures, or in this case, the malve, the, the love, the borrower himself said, this is my star, I did borrow this money, then, in other words, obviously the love is trying to say, but I paid you back, but the star already becomes valid, and therefore the witnesses are no longer believed anymore. They don't have this believability because they're the ones even telling us that the this, that this star is valid, and now they're trying to undo it. This is more like they signed. So if they had signed at the time and they were invalid, they should have said so when they signed. They shouldn't have signed in the first place. Okay, Gufa. Now we're going to go back to this line that Rav Huna just said. Amar Rav Huna Amar Rav. Modev shtar shekatvo en sarich lekaimo. Amar Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman says, Gan v'ginu ve'ilam alach. Why are you sneaking around? Just say it like it is. It's fair like a Rabbi Meir. If we just said that fits in with Rabbi Meir. So if you really want to say you hold like Rabbi Meir, em alacha ki Rabbi Meir. You should say the halacha is like Rabbi Meir. So, Amrale, he says, no. And so then his response is, Umar hechi Why are you giving me problems? Who do you hold like? Is it because you hold like Chachamim? Because you're trying to say, say you hold like Rabbi Meir, and that's where you got this statement from. And therefore, you want to basically say, but I disagree, because I hold like, right? And you should have said, I hold like Rabbi Meir, and that way it would have been obvious that whoever holds like Chachamim won't accept your statement. So he says, Umar hechi who do you hold like? Do you hold like Chachamim and that's why you're bothering me? Amar lei, ki atu lekam ledina, amrin an lehu, zilu kaimu shtarayachu v'chu to ledina. When they come before me to court, even if the Lova admits that this is his document, I still make them validate the signatures because I think the signatures need validation, which means also that in our case, if the witnesses themselves, if the, the ones who signed themselves validated the signatures, they'll be believed mishum apesh shasar apesh itir because we do need it. It's not enough to have the low vet validate the document. Amarav Yudah Amarav. Now we're going to talk about other types of shtarot. Okay, our Mishnah and the Brayta talked about a case where somebody claims, yes, these are my signatures, but something. So now we're going to have other types of claims like that. Okay, where there's a document that says, you owe me money, but we claim, you claim it's something else. Haomel, we're going to see exactly who claims. We don't know it's part of the problem here. If they say it's a shtar amana, uh, a document of trust, what does that mean? So there's many different interpretations in the commentaries what it means. One is to say that it's a document, I was planning to loan you money, you were planning to borrow money, but you're not ready yet to borrow the money. But we got it all ready. We decided let's just get ahead of ourselves so this way we can have it all done when you need the money. And we wrote up the star, and in fact, you even gave it to me, which is a little bit strange, and that's why it's called a document of trust, because you must trust me and assume I'm not going to, why, why is it strange? Because if I have an IOU that says you owe me money, well, I can claim it at any point, even though we, I actually never gave you the money. So it must be you trust me, and you trust me that I'm not going to claim it, the, try to take the money from you until we actually go ahead with the loan. But we even got witnesses to sign on it so that it's all ready to go. So... It's almost like sometimes you get a check signed, right? Even though you're not giving the check yet. So it's like a done deal. Even though there really was no loan, I never gave you the money. So if you say it's a shtar amana, so I go, let's say, go get the money. And then you claim it's a shtar amana. Ain't no neman. You're not believed to say that's not a real shtar. Dika amarman. So who's the one who said this is a shtar amana that they're not believed? And you'll see why they don't like what I just said. Ilema de ka'amra love, if it's that the love said it, pshita, kol kamine. Uh, if, a, if a love was believed to say, this is a shtar amana, when any time a malve, a borrower, uh, sorry, a lender, took out a document and said, hey, you owe me money, and he can claim, oh, it was just a shtar amana, so, of course, we're not going to believe him. I forgot, by the way, to say that there's two other interpretations of a shtar amana. A second interpretation is, the borrower wants to look wealthy. So the borrower goes to me as a friend and says, listen, I'll look wealthy if I can say I borrowed a million dollars from you. So will you write out a document that says I borrowed a million dollars from you just so I can look like I have fund, I have money in my hand. So that's a second interpretation where it's a totally false document. This is a little worse. Okay, We're going to see that the, the Gemara gives it a very bad rap and says you're basically a bad person if you do this. So the first one, isn't it really like you did something wrong? The second one is really like you did something wrong. Even the first one, look, it, it leads to problems because you're you're basically waving, you know, um, something in the face of the lender and giving them an opportunity to lie and cheat and basically try to take money. So that's where, in interpretation number one, it's a little bit evil. Interpretation number two is just a pure lie, 
right? In interpretation number three, it's really bad because what are you doing? Basically, let's say you owe money to somebody else. So you don't want to pay them back because you don't have the money. So you take out another, you take out a fake document. You write that I owe Michelle money. And then when they come to pay you, to get paid, you say, oh, look, well, I owe Michelle money. I got to pay her first. And, you know, maybe you change the date and make it, you know, you, uh, you make up a date that's earlier and say, look, I owe her money first. I'm going to only pay you later. So that's a really forged, a forgery that you're using to get out of something else. So if it's the lova, for sure the lova is not believed to just take a good, perfectly good-looking star and claim it's a star of mana. Can't be that's what Rav Yehud is telling us. It's so obvious. Ella de Kamra Malve, if it's the Malve saying it, the one who loaned the money, that, oh, yeah, I have this document. I know it looks like you owe me money, but you don't really. Well, tavola bracha. I mean, either it's true or it's not true and you're just letting me not pay, you know, I'm just letting you not pay back your money. That's a really nice thing I'm doing. Certainly we're not going to say I'm not believed. Ella de Kamra Edim, who's left? Maybe the witnesses said it's a Sharmana. That too. If the signatures are validated by somebody else, and now we know why they're bringing this here, for sure they're not believed. That's what our Mishnah said. They're not believed once their signatures are validated to claim, oh, well, this isn't really a good star. And if they, this is the only way to know their signatures is they claim, yes, this is our signature, but it's a star mana. Well, we should believe them. And this says, we don't believe them. Rav Yehuda said, we don't. So we're going to have three answers to this question. One's going to say it's the Lova. One's going to say it's the Malva. One's going to say it's the Witnesses. So I'm a Rava. Lo Olam de Kamar Lova. Rava says it really is that the Lova said it, the borrower. Now, why is it not so obvious? Well, the Amar of Uchidah Rav Huna, the Amar of Huna Marav, Modeh B'Shtar Shekitavo, Ain't Sarich Lekaimo. As soon as the Lova admits that this is a star, then we no longer need to validate the signatures. In which case, the signatures are valid. In which case, you think that it's a valid document. The Lova is basically saying, I owe you the money. And if the Lova, sorry, if, um, one second. Star Manao. Right, you might have thought, okay, let's look at Rashi for a minute. Kid Rav Huna. Ashmi'ina Rav Huna, Rav Yehuda Nami Hachi. Yehuda is saying the same thing basically that Rav Huna is saying, which is what? If the Lova said, I wrote it and I gave it to him, but it's a star amana. The Malve doesn't need to go bring witnesses to validate the signatures, because basically, we assume that a Lova is not going to write a star unless he really has a star. So therefore, just like we assume once he admits this a star, we basically accept it and make him pay the money back, right? It doesn't need kiyum shtarot. So basically here also, once the lova says it, once the lova validated it's a valid document, it's just star amana. We don't believe the second part. We basically believe that it's a valid document. He has the power to basically do kiyum shtarot. Once there's kiyum shtarot, right, the kiyum chatimot, the signatures are valid. Once the signatures are valid, there's no, nowhere to go after that. And that's really what he was trying to tell us. So there's a broader law, not just in this case, but in general. Option number two, Abaya Marlo Lamda Amar Malve. It's that the Malve said it, the, bar, the lender. Ukigo, now, what's the problem? Tavol Avracha, we said, if I just say you don't have to pay me back, I'm only doing something bad for me, not for anybody else. Well, Abaya's going to come up with a case where there's somebody else. Ukigo, Shechav Lachirim, what if I owe money to somebody else? And then, what's the issue? Uched Rabbi Natan, as Rabbi Natan says, and it goes like Rabbi Natan, de Tanya, Rabbi Natan Omer, minayin lenoshe b'chavero mane. If I owe someone else money, v'chavero b'chavero, but someone owes me money, minayin shemotzi'im mizeh v'notim l'zeh. Right? The person I owe money to can go demand the money, right? Let's say I owe money to Leah, and Rachel owes me money. So Leah can demand the money from Rachel. Okay? Tamud Lomar, where does we get it from? We learn it from Pasuk in the Torah that we can do this. So now we say, very simply, ah, it was a case where I owe money to somebody else. And then I claimed that this document was a shtar mana. It wasn't a real document because Leah wanted to demand it from Rachel. But I say, oh, that document with Rachel, that wasn't a real document. It was a fake document. And then I'm not believed in that case. Okay, next. Rav Ashi Amar Lo Olam Teka Amrei Edim. It's the witnesses. Okay, that's the one that's left. Ude Eng Tav Yadam Yosei Memakom Achel. It's a case where their signatures aren't valid, validated from anywhere else. Ude Kamar Ta Amai Lo Mehemne. Now we said before 
If their signatures aren't valid, then they should be believed. Pesha, Salwa, Peshi, Tir. They're the ones who tell us their signatures are valid. And they're the ones who say, but in the end it was valid for nothing because it was a fake document. Well, why are they not believed? Da'am Kedarav Kahana. Da'am Rav Kahana, and this goes back to something else we learned. Asur lo la'adam sh'yish hesh ta'arman abetoch peto. Mishum shenemar al tashkem ba'olecha avla. A person is not allowed to have a shtarmana. Now, when these adim said, we signed an shtarmana, what are they doing? They're basically saying, we did something terrible. Because they learned from the pasuk, it's pasuk and eov, al tashkem ba'olecha avla, don't allow in your tents to dwell misdoings, bad things. This is referring to a shtarmana. You shouldn't have a shtarmana in your house, and you certainly shouldn't sign on it. So what does this mean? Well, if the Adam go and sign and say, we signed an Ashar Manah, that makes them look bad. It's self-incriminating. What do we say? Ein Adam Usim Asmo Rasha. People don't make themselves into bad people. They don't come to court and say, I did something bad. Since Ashar Manah is bad, according to Rav Kana, they won't come into court and say that. So if they do, we don't believe them. And based on this, turning out Ramu Bet, Amar Rav Sheshe Pereit Rav Idi, you can learn from Rav Kahana that Eidim Sha'amru, Amana Yudvarenu, whatever we said was really not true. Okay, it was this Shtar Amana or something. Ein Amanim, they're not believed. Why? My Taima, Kevanda Avlai, Vavla, Lochatme. Can't be that we believe them ever to say that this was Amana because they would never, right? It's a bad thing, and since it's a bad thing, they will never make themselves Rishayim. Amar Rabbi Yashobet Levi. If we're talking about documents that you're not allowed to have, like shtar mana, we're now going to talk about other ones. Generally, if I loan you money, I keep the shtar. As soon as you pay me back the money, you make sure that the shtar is ripped up. And I certainly can't keep it in my house because if I did, let's say you didn't rip it up, I have to rip it up because otherwise I can basically go back to you and say, hey, listen, you owe me money. So comes Rabbi Yashob and Levi and he says the following. The same pasuk. Don't leave bad things in your round in your house, right? Like a star parua. Okay, you can't. If you, even if the lova didn't rip it up, the borrower, you as the lender have to rip up that document. Don't leave it in your house. In Israel, in the name of Rav, they said, This is the beginning of that verse. And now he's going to darshan the two parts of that verse. If there's bad things in your hands, Distance yourself from them, right? Put them away from you. This is two kinds. One, the shtar amana that we saw before. And one is a shtar pasim. What's a shtar pasim? Two different interpretations, just or at least two. Just like the amana. One is the flip of the amana. The amana, according to one interpretation, was that the borrower wants to make himself look wealthy or herself look wealthy by saying, I borrowed a million dollars from so-and-so, whatever amount of money. This is the reverse. The lender wants to look wealthy by saying, look, I lent out money to someone. So they make up a document. That's a shtar pasim. Why pasim? Lashon piusim, to appease. I find a friend who's willing to appease, be appeased, and basically say, look, I know we have a friendly relationship. Can you help me out? I need to look wealthy for whatever reason. So can you? Maybe you're trying to get a loan from the bank. So you say, listen, I lent out money to so-and-so. Look, I have money, obviously, and it makes me look wealthy. But obviously, it's just a fake. Another interpretation is, I don't want someone to seize my property, so I basically write it into someone else's name. Okay, this goes on, by the way, with wealthy people, certain, not obviously all wealthy people, but there are certain people who don't want to get taxed or want to avoid or or definitely comes up with politicians, do things like this, where they write in properties, they add in other people's names so that, you know, it's not, they don't have issues, all sorts of things, reasons someone might do that. Um, so... Sometimes people do that, right? I say wealthy people because it has to be someone who has property to be doing that with, right? And they're often trying to avoid, you know, let's say, taxes that are incurred by the wealthy. Um, in any case, obviously, most of the world doesn't do this. There's a small minority of people who do it, but we hear about them, right? So you can't write your property, your assets to somebody else as a fake to avoid someone trying to take them from you or whatever reason you're trying to avoid. So now, that's the first part of that pasuk. So those are two interpretations of what pasim are. Where it comes to the word pasim, according to that first interpretation, I'm not really sure. Va'al tash, maybe also it's a friend, so you're giving them, you know, milashon piusim to appease someone who's willing to just be a guinea pig in your little activity there. Va'al tash kembo alecha avla zeshtar parwa. Okay, don't, uh, the second part of that pasuk is referring to a star that was already given back. 
So now we have the al tshkei ba'olech havla could be shtar parua. It could be shtar amana. So now the Gemara says, man damar shtar parua kol shken shtar amana. If you say shtar parua, all the more so you'll say that a shtar amana because a shtar amana is way worse. But man damar shtar amana va shtar parua lo. Shtar parua is not as bad. Why? To zimni demash hele apshite to safra. While you pay back the loan, you might not have paid me the money it cost for me to get a scribe to write the star, and you really owe me that. So it could be I'm leaving it in my hands just until I get the final part of the loan back, which is this part that wasn't really part of the loan, but connected to the loan. So could be that there's a case where star parua wouldn't be so bad to leave in your house because you're actually leaving it there for a reason. Itma, another thing we learn from this pasuk. Sefer she'eno muga. If you have a book, meaning a Sefer Torah, that's not edited properly. Some people also say this can apply to a Mishnah or a Gemara. It's not properly edited. I'm a Rabbi Ami. Keep it in your house for 30 days, up to 30 days so that you fix it. If you didn't fix it after that, you can't leave it in your house. Because you shouldn't leave things that, again, cause misdoings. If somebody has, if you have a document that's incorrect, People will learn from it, right? You have a, a safer Torah that's incorrect. People might derive the wrong things. Certainly don't want that around. Amar Rav Nachman. Edim sh'amru amana yudvarenu. This is exactly what Rav Shesha said at the top of this, uh, this page. If you say, witnesses say, we were just lying, it was fake. Ein amanim, because again, they're making themselves into bad people. What if they said, moda'ah yudvarenu? We were forced into it, and afterwards we made this declaration, it's just not true. They're also not believed because, again, their signatures show this is a valid document. However, Mar Baravashi disagrees. Mar Baravashi, Amana Yudvarenu Em Nemani. Amana can never be a good thing, can never be true. It's a fake document. But Moda'a Yudvarenu Nemani. My time, Mahai Nitan Likateh, Vai Lo Nitan Likateh. You can't write a document of Amana, but you can write a regular document. Let's say someone put a gun to someone's head and said, Write this document and get witnesses to sign. And you get these witnesses to sign. And then the witnesses afterwards issue a declaration that says, by the way, that document I wrote yesterday or I signed yesterday, I never really meant to do it, just someone put a gun to my head and I had to write it. So that's actually permitted. So therefore, he says, they are believed to say, it, we, it was done under duress. Now, Rav asked Rav Nachman. Now, Rav Nachman said, not Amana and not Moda'a, neither are believed. But he says the following, What if you said, Yes, it was a shark. I signed on the document. And this was he sold this property to so-and-so. But it was under a particular condition. And the condition wasn't met yet. So what do we say? Moda, do we say, He's basically saying the star is invalid. And and that's why we don't believe him. Because the signatures are there and they're valid. Again, why are they valid? Because he says they're valid. Also here, he's basically saying, he's uprooting the star. He's basically saying the star is not true. Because it wasn't right. He didn't fulfill the condition. Oh, Dilma. Or do we say, Tanai milta achritan? No. Tanai is something else. Because often people make write a document and it's given under condition. And that's what the agent were there for. They, they were there when it happened and they can testify that there was a condition, a stipulation. So Amrale, so Rav Nachman answers, Ki atu the kaman ladino, when people come before me, Amrin on the I say to them, Zilu kimu, kaimu, kaimu, uh, kaimu tanaychu, vichu tu ladino. Go and fulfill the condition and then come to court before me. In other words, make sure the condition is filled. He believes that and then he makes sure that they go through with it. So he actually believes the witnesses when they say it was given upon condition. What if? Eid omer t'nai, ve'eid omer eno t'nai. What if one witness said it was given under condition, the other witness says, no, it wasn't given under condition, and both say, though, but that's my signature, that's my signature. So I'm a papa, a papa says something interesting. Travayu v'shtara ma'al yakam sadu. Both basically said the, star, the document is valid, and now you have one saying condition, one saying it wasn't condition. Hai t'kamer t'nai. And as without that, one witness usually doesn't hold up to anything. So let's ignore that one witness now, but, but we're going to split what he says. It's called Pagina Dibure. We split. We accept that he says this is my signature. We don't accept that he said it was upon condition because he's the only one who said that. And therefore, right, the one who says, Tanai, Havalechad, he's only one. His words 
it's a tanai is only one person. It doesn't stand up to the two people, which was him and the other guy, who said that this is a valid document. So you have the two signatures that, were, that are basically valid now and validated by each of the witnesses. And now you have only one saying it was a condition, so we ignore that. Matzkefler, a funa braider of Yoshui, says that's ridiculous. You could say the same thing if they both say what? How would it work? Let's say they both say it's a condition. You basically would then say two already validated it, and then we don't accept what comes after to say it's a tonight. So therefore, El Amrinan Hachi Lime Akar Sadute Kaate. Hainami Lime Akar Sadute Kaate. In other words, if we view these as two separate things, first they're saying we validate the star, then they're saying, but it was under condition, then we'd never be able to undo it. We'd never be able to undo if two people already validated the star. The star is valid. We don't accept them saying later it was a tonight, or we might not. So then he says, we don't view it like that. In other words, what's happening? If two come and say, these are our signatures, and then two come and say, but it was the same two say, but it was under condition, we basically view that, that the condition is undermining the first part of what they said, right? That's the words here. Um, I'm just reading inside. Ella Amrinan, Haine Lemi Akar Sadutikat. It's not that there's two parts. Yes, these are our signatures, but it was conditioned. No, these are our signatures, and yet we signed it while it was under condition, meaning they're undoing what they did before. And therefore, we accept what they say in the end. Ella, then therefore, Hainami Lemi Akar Sadutikat. The first one, when it's only one who says it was tonight, he's basically undoing his line that, yes, I signed on this. It's basically saying my signature doesn't mean anything, which means we don't have two people validating the signatures. And therefore, can't be what you're saying. So we can't just split what he says. It's all part of one thing. This is my signature, but I'm saying it's really not. And therefore, there is no two people validating the signatures. And therefore, the, and the Gemara holds like him, Hilchatak, Rav Huna, Bered, Rav Yoshua. Tanu Rabbana, Brayta. Shnayim chatumim al ashtar umetu. Two people signed and then they died. Two people from the Shuk come, and now it's going to be like our mission, except it's two other people saying this about the witnesses. We recognize their signatures. But they were forced into it, or they were minors when they signed, or they were disqualified witnesses. They're believed. Because again, we wouldn't validate their signatures without this testimony. And while they're saying they're valid, in the same breath, they're saying they're not valid. But if there's witnesses, like we can know where this is going, just like our others, or we had proof that these are their signatures, we have their signatures on record, right? How so? There was a different document with their signatures on it that somebody tried to say this isn't a valid document and they verified their signatures and therefore they're on record. We already know this and not believe because it's not a pesha sa'u a pesha and therefore we don't allow it. We don't believe them, right? Because again, they already testified, right? That we already have signatures to witnesses that's already valid. And we, ex- we basically collect this money as if it's a really valid star. But why? There's two witnesses saying it's a valid document. Those are the two that signed. And we have witnesses that their valid signatures are valid. And two witnesses that say, but it was under duress or they were psule edut. So this should be what we call a dud hakasha, contradictory testimony. We should throw it all out. How can you basically collect the money? So Amar Rav Sheshed, Zot Omeret, from the fact that we don't allow this, it must be there's some technical problem here. And it must be that HaKhasha Tchilat HaZamai. There's two types of contradictory witnesses in Halacha. There's HaKhasha. We say, you owe the money, right? The other two say it's not a valid document. That's contradictory, right? It is valid, it's not valid. Okay. That's contradictory. That's our case. Then we have Eidut HaZama. What's that? And Eidut HaKhasha, we basically don't know who to believe, so we throw everyone out of court. And we basically go back to status quo. But hazama is when two witnesses testify, and two witnesses come and say, Imanu ayitem, you were with us on that day that you claimed that you were there, and there's no way you could have gone from one place to the other, and therefore, we know that you're lying. Not because we're disagreeing about the content of what you said, we're disagreeing about the fact that you couldn't possibly have been witnesses. That the Torah allows, either because it's a chidosh, it's a special unique halacha, or because it's kind of like they're testifying about them. You have two witnesses saying, 
your invalid witnesses, just like we'd accept two witnesses to say, you're a psule do, you're a karov, you're a relative or something like that. So we accept two witnesses to say, you weren't there at the time that you said, because we were with you somewhere else. So now, Hazamah has all sorts of rules, and we're going to read that right now. But the point is that Hakasha is inherently connected with Hazamah. It's like the beginning of Hazamah. The beginnings of, to get to Hazamah, you could start with Hakasha, again, how exactly I understand this is a good question, but it means, what it really is trying to say is, they're part of one in the same package, even though Hakasha we don't accept, and Hazamah we do, right? In other words, Hakasha we throw everyone out of court, Hazamah will basically say, the first two are invalid, the second two are right. Well, but the rules have to be the same for all of them, meaning, just like you can't do a de'azama if the witnesses are dead. There's no such thing as turning them into edim zomimim if they're already dead. You can't do that. You can't invalidate their testimony once they're dead. So likewise, that's why we don't believe the second two here, because the first two who signed are dead. And you can't invalidate witnesses who are dead. Why is that? Because they can't come and speak up for themselves and come and support your claim. At least that's what it seems to me. So you can't do that, and that's why we believe them. And that's what Rosh Hashanah says. You can learn from here that a do that Hakasha must have the same rules as Hazama, and that's why this doesn't work. Wishing everyone a good day, and pick up from here tomorrow.